What's the matter, kids? Afraid to get a little dirty! now <laughs> so everybody knows what you just said that's all right that's okay though people know I'm nervous absolutely I'm nervous we write things we, write things. we don't talk about things we write things around here <laughs> and this is your pal dusty cat over here on the fabulous west coast where it's another bright and sunny day not quite as hot as it was last show where ali zoto almost took over the valley for 800 years of unrelenting heat. But I think Daring Do got him that time because it sort of cooled off a bit. So thank you, Daring Do. Awesome. But with me tonight, with me tonight, is a wonderful person. We spent a little bit of time down at Equestria LA a couple years ago talking about stuff and cartoons and comics and things like that. And been trying very hard to get her on this program, but Ben 10 just grabbed her and said, no, I will not let you go, <laughs> ever, because I'm just going to, like, take off, sort of like My Little Pony, it just took off. Ben 10, just popular, popular, and I have for you tonight, Miss Charlotte Fullerton. Char. Hello. Hello. There she is. There I am. There you are. Miss Charlotte Fullerton is with us tonight. How are you doing? Oh, uh, pretty okay. Like you were just talking about the weather. Looking forward to some rain. Exactly. Yeah, I know. Jesus. It was buggy, un, un, unusual for Southern California. Wow. It's like deadly it's hot. We have, it's yeah. kind of exciting around here. <laughs> yeah. With, with wildfires and all kinds of stuff. I mean, California's in the midst of the worst drought it's ever had. I can remember only one rainy day this winter. I know. That sticks out of my mind. One, one or two, yeah. Yeah, and that's insane. It's I mean, it's crazy here. I mean, we need some water. Mm -hmm. We should we should have trucked some of that snow from the East Coast back when oh, they still had it. Families in New England, and, and they yeah. would gladly send some. some, some yeah, put some put some tra to... train cars full of snow. Yes. And send them out here. Sure. <laughs> we'll take it. Anyway, <laughs> evolved into talking about the weather. Yes, <laughs> evolved into talking about the weather. Let's talk cartoons. Let's talk cartoons. You not oh. only. <laughs> wrote seven different episodes of our favorite show, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, but also wrote for Kim Possible, Superhero Squad, and, of course, what you're best known for is Ben 10. Right? So... Is that what I'm best known for? I'm best, I think that's what you're best known for is Ben 10, because you're all over that show. All over that show. But here's, here's my standard stock first question to everybody who comes on this program. What are some of the cartoons and comics you enjoyed when you were younger, or even now, are enjoying? Ah, good question. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's kind of strange that I ended up working in children's television, actually, because uh, my parents were extremely strict about what we could watch on TV, and I didn't see a lot of really? um, television as a kid. We could only watch PBS, so, um, <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> for real? But actually... Um, see a lot of things age appropriately as a kid and only, you know, found out about them like when I got to college and watched 
things and reruns that, that had been on when I was a kid. So it was a little weird just not having the same pop culture references as, as everybody else my age, you know, and they mm-hmm. were talking about um, a lot of Hanna-Barbera stuff, and I'm just, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, my favorite thing probably by default, actually, mm-hmm. now that I think about it, was, the you know, I, I love the Muppets, but oh, yeah. I saw a ton of Sesame Street, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, Sesame Street, Mr. Yeah. Rogers, those kind of things, uh, three to one contact. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> But a huge Muppets fan in the Muppet Show. Mm-hmm. Um, so not cartoons, but children's programming. Um, right, the right. Muppets is probably the, the number one uh, influence on me, uh, certainly as a child and as an adult, in terms of my sense of storytelling and humor and character and all those kind of things. Yeah. It's a good um, influence to have. It's, I think so. Absolutely. <laughs> and certainly when I went away to film school and realized that the, how much the Muppets had derived from vaudeville yeah yeah absolutely doing... I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this one question though oh sure muppets tonight mm-hmm. yes or no uh like many things yes and no they had hit and misses. <laughs> um i loved the bit um uh with fozzy as the emperor and the emperor's new clothes yeah uh, the nothing's too good for you mm-hmm. that Rizzo and the rats sang right. um, when they made him his in- invisible clothes. It was it, that was hysterical. Mm-hmm. Uh, the shoemaker and the Elvises, um, you know, certain things that were extremely muppety, old school yeah. in character, very funny, yeah. um, and then other things that just you know that, that didn't necessarily work for those same reasons. It yeah. wasn't. Uh, it's, to me, there's just a sense that I'm sure. You could say the same thing about Pony or anything you know really well. When characters are behaving like themselves yeah. or not. Or not, yeah. Um, or tonally the show is itself or it's not. <laughs> um, or the property is, you know, you're like, well, that's not. I, mean, I grew up watching Star Wars, the old school, you know, mm-hmm. first Star Wars movies were also a huge influence because that's the reason I chose to go to USC film school because mm-hmm. that's what George Lucas went. I wouldn't have heard of the place. Um, and... I mention it now because just the idea of there being so many derivative properties at the time, you know, all the marketing that went along with it, and you'd read, or, uh, yeah, I guess it would have been mainly reading back then, or, you know, the records were, Mm -hmm. had sound bites from the movies and things, but marketing materials that were clearly written by marketing people, I don't want to dismarketing people because I was one, Right. Um, and the pony stuff, by the way, the marketing for it is hugely, wonderfully in character. I've been yeah. super impressed with whoever's doing that because um, it isn't easy and, and uh, it's, it's blown me away, you know, as a fan of not just pony, but of anything and having written marketing things and mm-hmm. been frustrated as a fan again, <laughs> Star Wars when it doesn't you go. That's not right. You know, that's not the way. It's no, yeah. it's not um, the way. Not the way it should be. It's not real. You know, nope. it's like okay. Even as a kid, I could tell that's that's somebody else writing Luke Skywalker. That's not that's, really yeah, that's the not. real. Thing. Yeah, I want the real thing. No, nope. there was only three movies, so there, it wasn't you know this glut of um, of stuff. Yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you only had the three. So. Uh, what else did you have? Oh, comic books. So anyway, uh, moving on. Wait, wait, wait. You asked about comic books. Should moving, I, moving, moving on. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see that we're going to have lots to talk about because we're just going to talk. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, like, this I is great. Books, though, because I, I have sort of an unusual, or at least most people don't don't seem to know about this, and oh, they no, should. Oh, this is awesome. But I collected as a kid, and yeah. it shows, shows how hugely uncool I was and am, but it was Richie Rich and Casper. I yeah. Still have them all. Yeah. Not Richie Rich, not Casper, but the combo title. Richie oh, Rich. that one. Oh. And it's awesome, and I love it. I know that I one. I love it. I know that one. And they had no credits in them, so I didn't know who wrote them yeah. or edited well, them. Well, it was like them. Disney. Every Disney comic was drawn by Walt Disney. Every one. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know? But since then, um, as an adult, I, I met uh, through through my late husband, um, mm-hmm. his first boss at Marvel, um, Sid Jacobson, was the editor of those Richie Rich comics. Ah, cool. I loved so much. Yeah. And, and has since autographed things. And the guy, one of the guys who drew them, mm-hmm. um, co-created uh some some characters uh, a title at marvel with my late husband ernie cologne nice was the, the 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 artist on those and so it's just you know coincidentally yeah <laughs> strange but it's, well, like, oh my God, it's, it's wonderful because i came out of, i came out of the comic book side i mean i i've got like 50 episodes 50 issues of heckle and jekyll 
you know, cool. upstairs. So it's like... <laughs> Okay, yeah. good. So I'm not the only... No, 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 no. You're not the only uncool comic geek around here. Trust me. Not not even. And Casper, with their, you know, they, they would, I don't know, I don't know, devolve into a Richard and Casper conversation. <laughs> I could go on and on about, you know, these great... Uh, well, I guess apparently, from what Dwayne told me, Ernie Klum was a huge Tintin fan, and that's what he mm. really wanted to be doing. So right. that's why Richard, Richard and Casper did... Like they got the seven league boots and went through Gulliver's Adventures mm-hmm. and you know these kind of things where right. it wasn't a straight ahead Richie Rich book and it wasn't a straight ahead Casper book. book. Yeah. It was its own little adventure, you know, yep. surreal, dreamlike, thing. referencing literature and I yeah. thought it was cool. But um, like I said, I, I'm the yes. very definition of uncool and why change now? I've never what? been cool. Oh, before, never, so. never change, never change. <laughs> I don't want you to change. Yay. We see, we have not seen you. Since season two. And then you pop back up with Power Ponies. Just out of nowhere. It's like, oh, Charlotte's back. Oh, my God. Yay. And But and did... Want, you know, I was did, just tied up... Um, yeah, with, with Ben 10, 10 obviously. Busy. Too busy? Uh, just, also just a question of time. I mean, yeah. so, so contractually, I couldn't do it. And then um, there just wasn't enough, you know, enough hours, hours a uh, day. Yeah. Enough hours a day um, to give it my full attention. And that's why, even on Power Ponies, I, I had a break... I can't mm-hmm. remember what summer it was. There was a summer between seasons of Ben 10 mm-hmm. where I did um, with, with Betsy McGowan, who's one of the co-creators of Camp Lake Bottom on, on Disney XD and, and is fantastic and yeah. hugely talented and funny, all that great stuff. Um, so without her, I probably couldn't have time managed getting that, that episode in. But it, it was crazy good. From a comic book guy, you know, crazy good. I loved well, it. Cool. Well, Megan had a lot to do with it, too. I don't want to, you know, yeah. and everybody down the line, of course. That's yeah. one of the great things about My Little Pony. I've said it before in interviews. You've heard me say it because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's true. I mean, yeah. It's, it's it, everybody true. puts in their two cents. Big Jim Miller's everybody just stuck a bunch. It, you know, yeah. It's just such a wonderful experience. And a lot of show and Ben 10's been the same way. There's a lot of shows that are frustrating because there's as you go down the assembly line of, of production and mm-hmm. as a writer, you're, you're way near the beginning. Um, and you see things unfold with the voices, with the storyboards, with the directors, you know, everybody down the line. Um, there's sometimes there's a weak link or they run out of time or they run out of money or, you know, whatever reason yeah, yeah. down the chain, they're not able to do their best work. It's mm-hmm. not that the people aren't good. It's that they're yeah. in a crunch where they're frustrated and they just couldn't, they yeah. just had to get it done. They yeah. couldn't go that extra mile. And on things like Ben 10 and 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 My Little Pony for whatever reason it's just that you know mm-hmm. magic, <laughs> magic magic just, happens just you know you just never know what's what's going to work and what isn't and everybody is I, mean, I don't know if we're all just picturing the same end product for mm-hmm. whatever reason it's it's so cohesive what, what Lauren and, and Rob came up with for, for My Little Pony we we all seem to be mm-hmm. able to see it. To write it, perform it, draw it. Everybody has the same end product in mind. Mm-hmm. Not not the same as in you know, rigidly it must be like this, but but the same sense sense of tone and of you know the style of it. So that when the composer takes over, say from some lyrics that I've written or co-written, yeah. or you know when the director takes over and stages the scene. It's not like it. Oh, that's exactly the way I pictured it. It's like oh my god, that's even better. Yeah. Than what I, yeah, that's awesome. You started writing Wonderful. for you started writing for TV way back. According, <laughs> according to your IMDb in '96 yeah. on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers of all shows. <laughs> My very first produced script was on Mighty Crazy. Morphin Power Rangers. I was working. Uh, my first job out of college was answering the phones at Fox Kids Network. Okay. And while I was there, um, friends of mine and I had. Uh, created a show and, and we sold it to the network and also ended up writing on I get on my day job was answering phones but mm-hmm. I ended up writing on on shows and building their walk around character costumes wow uh, I sent out to the affiliates and I got to direct uh, live action stuff in the promo department up at Universal Studios and Great. all con- I mean it was yeah. really Fox Kids was just an amazing learning mm-hmm. experience and, and professional growth experience. I'm still friends with, with all kinds of folks from back then. You know, That's great. That's great. Yeah. My peers that have worked their way up. It, it's like, I say it all the time, all roads lead back to Fox Kids. You know, I'm so glad I had that as my first professional experience. That's cool. And Margaret Lesh, who was our president and CEO at Fox Kids, 
in later in my life ended up being the president and CEO of the hub. So I was working. Oh, for- there you go. See her every day when I was doing my old poetry. It's like, wow, all roads lead back to Fox Kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, next question. I had, um, let's see. Oh, everything. You were doing PCs, ones, and twosies, you know, for years, and then all of a sudden, this little Japanese show, Duel Masters, comes along. Ah, uh, yes. And was that actually an English dub of a Japanese show, or was that like a was that like made from scratch? That's a really good question because it's an interesting hybrid. It's not the normal. I, I had previously written a couple of Digimon episodes mm-hmm. and I've done um, a handful of Zatch Bells, and, and those are more. Uh, and even now, I guess uh, Transformer Cybertron just came out on on DVD. I wrote the right. quote lost episode of that, um, yes. and those are all real straight ahead um, translations. You know, dubs of right whatever the script was and you count the lip flaps of the characters and yeah. you just have to write English words that you know it's that, like, oh, that blah, fit. Blah, 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 something blah, 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 that fits that cadence and, and the actors have to be really precise in, in timing mm-hmm. what they uh, what they do to match. Duel Masters back in 2004-2005 um, was different in that we took the first 26 episodes of Duel Masters Mm-hmm. Into the edit bay, like we being uh, Kevin Rubio, who, who co-wrote the um, Find a Pet um, song okay. with me. We were co-nominated and co-lost an Emmy for that, which was wonderful. Yes. Um, <laughs> he's also the writer-director of the Star Wars fan film Troops. Ah. A bunch of friends made and super talented, super funny guy. But he was the, uh, the mastermind behind the original Duel Masters, which was to... What's up, Tiger Lily? The heck out of it, or the hell out of it, mm-hmm. as he, he said. Um, and it was to take the 26 episodes into the edit bay and recut them mm-hmm. to fit what the the story was that we were writing and telling. So there was a certain amount of matching lip flap, mm-hmm. but it was it was inverted. It, um, it was sort of like what they did with Science Ninja Team Gotcha Man in the 70s, and when they recut it into Battle of the Planets. Yeah. Because it was so violent that they had to cut all the violence out and then yeah. had to come up with... We had a friend from um, Kids WB promos, Eric Richter, who mm-hmm. at the time was doing Harvey Birdman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Law. And it was a lot like that where, you know, you take the characters, and he had come from promos just like we did, and, and so we were sort of used to manipulating existing animation to fit our own purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is wonderful to see on YouTube now. You know, like that we didn't have YouTube yeah. back then. Yeah, right? now now we're all do, we're all doing it. Yeah, it's fantastic to be able to do that. So everybody gets it now. The idea of editing existing, um, not just the mouth moves, but what yeah. the characters are doing, and you know, yeah. to, to tell your own version of. Oh the yeah, story. it's like our our entire fandom lives on that. Yeah, and we totally. love it. And, and so that's what that original um, twenty six of of Duel Masters. That's what it was about, and that's how it was done. Instead of just, and it was way more time intensive and and, oh, yeah. and, uh, and expensive and, and all to do. Um, and it was production company Mickey Corcoran's company, Plastic Cow, which mm-hmm. is fantastic, and everybody there just again, much like with with Ben Ten and with uh, My Little Pony, just going above and beyond. And instead of yeah. just done, you know, churn it out and it's done. Get yeah, it then. Yeah, like 2000, 2010 comes along, right? The doors yeah. fling open, and all of a sudden you have My Little Pony and Ben 10 and Fairly Odd Parents and Care Bears, and they all come calling now. It's like, do you even remember 2010? Well, it was before <laughs> 2010, actually. Let's see, Kim Possible was more like 2006. Yeah, six, yeah, was, six, yeah. Um, and then the same thing, uh, gosh, when did we start? You know, My Little Pony, Fairly Odd Parents, Fairly, I yeah. wrote in 2008. Eight. October 2008, mm-hmm. because I was in France. I was in Paris. So that's my, with my my husband. He that's where he proposed. Ooh. Um, it was 2007, 2008, um, and I was writing that uh, that fairly odd parents episode. Uh-huh. And he was writing a Justice League Heroes video game, and we were joking that we're we're in the left bank in Paris, and we're writers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then to get. You know, that Butch Hartman even asked me to write A Fairly Odd Parents was just heaven because I was such a fan. I still mm-hmm. am, you know, huge fan of it. Um, to get to write one at all 
and then to be nominated for my first Emmy and of course lost that one too so I'm a two-time loser and proud of it but you know to there lose that's just a, you know above and beyond to, oh my god I get to write a failure out there and I get an Emmy nomination but obviously the lesson to be learned there is if you want Emmy quality work yep. out of me you have to send me to Paris there you go <laughs> Paris it must you know that's a, that's a, yes. so we get to your first pony episode look yes. before look before you sleep Yes. Giving us the great lines like rarities, it is on. <laughs> and Applejacks can't hear you. I'm asleep. Fake mm -hmm. snoring. Um, this episode made me feel like you've been to more than one slumber party in your life. Tell Oddly enough, no. Oh, what? One of those things growing up, uh, you know, getting sort of strict parents where we, we, we didn't, uh, we weren't allowed to sleep over at other people's houses. Oh, man. We weren't allowed to have friends sleep over. My mom had the rule, everybody's got their own bed to sleep in. The only time I had a friend over was when her house burned down. Oh, wow. And uh, she stayed with us for quite a while, and it was like, she doesn't have her own bed to sleep in, Mom. You know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, that's uh, weird. And they obviously, you know... Um, how could a parent say no to that anyway under the circumstances? But from kid point of view, it was, yeah. see, see the rules. See the rules. The rules can bend. That was something else with Look Before You Sleep yeah. um, that my, my husband mentioned was that uh, Twilight with her, her uh, stickler for the rules and, you know, officially having fun yes. and checking things off the list. He's like, gee, that just seems a little bit familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> By that. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, suited for your success yeah. was next. And we get not only a fashion show out of it, but a great song, Art of the Dress, which is a straight homage to Stephen Sondheim. Yes. Um, Sunday in the Park with so George, I believe it was. Inspired by and yes. thanks to the... To Tell the us... Freaky okay. knowledge of... of, of uh, Freaky of knowledge of songs. Musical history. There you go. Musical theater, uh, Kevin Rubio. Um, again, yeah. I got to pick his brain um, for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, because he he just he knows his musical theater history and I can say I had this idea this is what I need the song to be this style mm -hmm. tone whatever you know the purpose of it throw some musical theater history at me and he'll send me YouTube links like yes. okay how about this one I'm like mm, no no it's got to be more like you know you know I don't, I'll, I'll know when I see it kind of yeah. thing and oh, yeah. he'll he'll be able to wade through just from his own <laughs> his own brain. Yep. Uh, rather than me having to do all this research. So he's, he's, he's been invalu invaluable when it comes to that kind of thing. Oh, that's cool. This episode yeah, this episode is also the one that hooked me on this show. This is oh, the one. Cool. The scene with Rarity's dramatic monologue where she doesn't know what to wallow in. <laughs> Brilliant. Where Brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Where, where, what do you wear when you go into exile? Um, I laughed so hard I think I pulled something. Cool. Actually, um, it was also showed that this show. It cause harm to our no. viewers and our fans. It, you know what? Our job. It also showed that this show was not going to go the frou frou tea parties and fashion show route of all other girl shows. It's just not. We had our fashion show, but it wasn't, you know, frou frou. Mm -hmm. It was basic. It was something different. You still had it. It was still a girl show, but it was it was a different way to do it. Um, not in the same way, old way of telling it. Um, it's, was this as a conscious effort between the first season writers? It's like, okay, we have to do these themes. Let's flip them on their head. Well, uh, it's really all Warren Faust and, and Rob Renzetti, who were the, you know, obviously the, the showrunner and the head writer uh, mm -hmm. slash story editor is the technical term for head writer in, in kid shows. Um, it was really all, all them, and I'm sure the, the other writers would at the time would agree um, because they'd have us in each individually. Uh, it wasn't like a writing staff where we all sat there and you know came up with every episode. I didn't know what the other writers were working on. They didn't know what I was working on. It's it's the showrunner and the story editor who were the, the linchpins mm -hmm. between each uh, you know each of the other writers. So they they deal with the consistency. So it was really um, their sense of the tone of the show, that the way they wanted it to be, mm -hmm. and and the way they. Uh, allowed us, you know. I felt, you know, it was it was that I was being allowed to tell what I think of as a more Muppety, old school Muppety kind of style, which I love. Obviously, I've yeah. mentioned it often enough. That it, like you said, it's not precious, and it's mm -hmm. not. We're now learning and growing, girls. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's talking down to girls. Yeah. Uh, you know. Having grown up a little girl that you know was talked down to by TV largely, you know mm -hmm. it's um, it beyond irritating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was frustrating as heck to 
be employed and expected to do that. You know, if you just feel, you know, that talk about feeling like a sellout, you don't mm -hmm. want to have to do that. Um, and I know that was a huge uh, uh, sort of mission statement of, of Lawrence, but it was wonderful, um, and it is wonderful, you know, on shows like Ben 10 and others, uh, can possible when we're told or allowed to write character, you know, write yeah. fun, right? It, it doesn't mean it has to be, how do you describe it? It's not like The Simpsons, or which I love, or yeah. South Park, which I also love. You know, it's not obscene, it's not for adults. It's still very much appropriate for little girls, mm -hmm. little children, adults, whatever. Just like Sesame Street was, yeah. you know, it's for ch children, mm -hmm. but adults Got it. could get something out of it too. Yeah. You know, there, was, there were extra an extra layer of, um, mm -hmm. of fun or cleverness or whatever, you, you know, references to things or, I, 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 it's hard to describe it. It's another one of those things you know it when you see it, mm -hmm. or you know it when you hear it. No, when you hear it. I'm, I'm really glad that you guys all, all caught on because oh. we never could have predicted. We were, I mean, God, that, that's that's the dream, isn't it? Yep. The, the adults will get it also. And, all, and, adults will get it. Like, may the best pet win. Mm -hmm. Brings back another musical style song in Find a Pet. Uh, which musical did this one get based on? Because to me, it has Doctor Doolittle in it. That's it, uh, Kevin Rubio. Again, when I told him, I, you know, I needed a, a sales pitch. Um, you know, what, that's mm -hmm. basically what it is. You know, conversation, and you know, sort of well, no, reluctant. Uh, one reluctant party, and the other one, you know, trying to sell them on something, and this conversation back and forth, and mm -hmm. and so he sent me a few different samples off of YouTube of, of existing musical theater songs and, and I'm like, no, not quite that. And it, it was uh, So Many Wonderful Places from, from Dr. Doolittle. Right. I'm like, yes, that's it. That's perfect. You know, that type of thing. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, took, took it from there. Well, this next question I had, because we, we've actually talked about some other stuff, which is basically baby cakes. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes down to learning responsibility. I mean, you're teaching responsibility to kids through Pinky. Right, responsibility taking responsibility pie. Yeah, yeah, that's your yeah, responsibility pie. So my question was prior experience in babysitting, but from you've told me earlier, I don't think you actually your mom let you babysit anybody. Well, strangely enough, I did. I'm, I'm, um, in fact, my Kim Possible episode was about babysitting as well, and I have have extensive experience Woo. babysitting both in my own family and and the neighborhood kids and all that because uh, I'm not the oldest in the family but I'm the oldest girl. Uh -huh. I was often in charge and also my mom had uh, family daycare in our home the whole time mm -hmm. I was growing up and then even after I left home as an adult uh, she continued and um, foster kids and emergency foster kids and there were just lots of kids and it's just it's wonderful. <laughs> it's a great way to grow up. It's just always you know, I, I loved school, but you all, I always felt like I'm missing out on the fun at home, too, because yeah. there's always something awesome that went on there, too. <laughs> like, yeah. Luckily, we had a really good school where there was super fun stuff going on, so I, I one of the, another way I'm uncool and nerdy kid where I uh, not only never played sick to stay home from school, but I would, you know, mm -hmm. even if I was legitimately sick and, you know, collapsing from exhaustion, you must stay home. Like, no, don't make me stay home from school because something awesome will happen. And, <laughs> and we get back to season four now yes. with Power Ponies, a straight up homage to comic book superheroes. And with you doing Ben 10, seemed right up your alley. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how, why they approached me for it, incidentally. Yeah. How much? They wanted, yeah. they wanted to do, a, you know, the, the ponies as superheroes. And right. Like, oh, you do superheroes and you do ponies. Help us. And I'm like, of course. Of course. How hard was it to figure out the power that each pony would have? Well, we, uh, and we being uh, me and Betsy and Megan, uh, sat down and at our story first story meeting, kind of, we, Betsy and I pitched Megan ideas on, you know, which would be the most fun and mm -hmm. character-wise for, uh, for each pony to, to have, you know, uh, which kind of power, I mean, for, right. for each pony to have and, and kind of bring the most out of them and uh, personality-wise or character, of course, Fluttershy, you know, I was, you know, big proponent for her having to hulk out. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, and, and the idea that she's reluctant to, uh, to lose her temper is wonderful. Um, yeah, so as I recall, that was a pretty collaborative process where, where Betsy and I came up with a bunch of ideas, brought them in. Megan came up with a bunch of ideas. We kind of talked through them. She pitched them to Hasbro. They came back with, you know, which, which ones they thought 
were strongest in their own ideas and kind of went back and forth that way. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Um, next question. The thing that's, that bugs me a bit is yes. that with the intro of season four, we no longer get the letter to the princess mm. that we was so prevalent in the first two seasons, especially when you were writing your episodes. Um, and for the most of the episodes you wrote, do you feel that it's a missing element that a letter now and then from Twilight to her mentor would add to certain storylines as a writer? I mean, do you, do you think that... I know you've been gone for a while, but do you think that element should should be still be there? For, that's that maybe a question for Megan. I'm not quite sure why the decision was made. I'm sure it came down from, you know, Hasbro and the Hub or, you know, whoever uh, the powers that be get to get to override mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know why they decided to, to lose that as a, a convention it, it it definitely helped pinpoint what the you know the moral the lesson of the story is yeah and um, I don't know if, if it just became a question of screen time you know where you have to set it up and then you have to pay it off at the end and, and there's not enough time for the story or hmm. if they just felt like you know, they'd done enough episodes that way and they kind of wanted to shake things up a little bit. Um, I, yeah, I honestly don't know who made the decision and why. Mm -hmm. um, may just be, you know, it was time for a change. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know I had a lot of fun with, I'm trying to remember, probably, was it Bird in the Hoof? You just watched all of my episodes. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Tell me where I sort of joked about, um, because Celestia was there. Was there. It's like, should I write you a letter this, for this one? It's like, no, I think I can remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think I can remember. And then I think it was, and may, may the best pet win. We, mm -hmm. I did a, a throwback at the end. Say, same kind of thing. We even sang about it. You know, yeah, that we makes even, it even more important. Yes. Yeah. Should we sing about it again? It's exactly. like, yeah, exactly. that was it. Yeah, that was that was we funny. Got, we were allowed to kind of have have fun with the the letters to, to Celestia. It wasn't yep. just like you had mentioned before this idea of, of a preciousness to girls. Mm -hmm. Uh, cartoons or, or properties that are aimed at girls and and having to be you know let's all talk slowly and you know tentatively yeah and, let's not do that uh, yeah that doesn't have a, a, a great the great sense of humor and the great right. sense of timing and just mm -hmm. you know I don't know about the other writers but I wrote my middle my my little ponies with very uh, muppety in mind and, and fairly odd parents in mind in terms yeah. of uh, character and timing and a wise crackiness, but again, not not like a South Park or a Simpsons where it's inappropriate for little right. kids. It's hard to describe because if you say edginess, it sounds too. It's too edgy. It's too yeah. People yeah. think too edgy. It's, it's not edginess. edginess. It's not edgy. It's just it's just up to that line of funny without going over it. Exactly. It's, it's funny enough for. Yeah. I mean, you could say Sesame Street in the seventies was edgy, but it was for preschoolers. Yeah. It was for preschoolers, but you know, Stevie Wonder played Sesame Street. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Stevie Wonder played on Sesame Street. I mean, come on. He was saying the music on Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, was way too hip for kids. Way too hip for kids. Um, <laughs> your, your episodes are always getting picked by the fans for the Hub Marathons, always. When the fans oh, get to pick, oh, all yours come up. Um, <laughs> but with, with your success on Ben 10, Universe IP, will we ever get to see you come back other than, like, here's a special thing on Season 4 because you wrote superheroes. Are you... Do they? Do you think they're ever going to bring you back, or are you just too tied into contracts with Ben Ten? Um, they definitely asked, um, and and I'm sure you know would have me back any time, and I'd love to. It's it's a question of of time. Yeah, we we had uh, 80 episodes of Ben Ten to get through in, wow. in, in less than three years, and yeah. it was relentless. Um, wonderful and great group of people to work with. Thank goodness they're a great group of people to work with that we couldn't have done it, you know, um, all of us. Um, but it's just, it's a lot to do in a short amount of time. Absolutely. Um, and uh, without getting too maudlin here, it came right on the heels of my, my husband's sudden um, mm -hmm. um, death. Yeah. And, you know, he died end of February 2011. And I was in the, in the process of, uh, at the time, I was writing a Green Lantern mm -hmm. with Kevin Rubio. I was writing. I was supposed to be writing a Power Rangers for James Bates, who's another mm -hmm. wonderfully talented writer I've known for years. Um, that I believe Dave McDermott um, and Kevin Rubio took over, 
they did a musical, I think, now, now that I think back on it. Wow. <laughs> With them, they did a I hadn't seen it, but I heard it. It went over really well. But I was also in the middle of writing Putting Your Hoof Down. Mm -hmm. I had done the outline, which which is the story credit, you see. Right, the story credit. And yeah. then somebody else. Um, Meriwether Williams. Yeah. Uh, so you know better than I did, took over writing the actual script, the teleplay. Mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, scheduled to have my story meeting the very next day. Mm -hmm. um, for the finale of season two mm -hmm. that I was originally scheduled to write and then of course um, couldn't. Of course couldn't. Yeah. Um, so. Anyway, sorry. Anyway, I'm, no worries, no worries. I don't all mod them, but no. uh, that's factual and it's related to My Little Pony, so I mm -hmm. should let you guys know. Well, that's, that's, it was one of the things that was like, okay, uh, it was one of the things, my questions on, on why you got story instead of everything. I didn't understand when, when that happened, so. Um, our condolences to you. Just for other people, yeah. um, you know, for whatever reason, if people get, you know, fired off a job or they mm -hmm. quit a job or they just only contracted to do, you know, the first part. Right. Um, there are some shows where uh, the head writer, the, the story editor, will write all the stories themselves mm -hmm. and story by, you know, the outlines and will have story by credit and right. then they pass out the, you know, the, the outlines for freelance writers to, to write. Mm -hmm. um, there are shows like, um, well, on Benton Omniverse, a lot of them, Matt Wayne, who's an outstanding writer, and you can um, IMDb him, he's uh, done everything. <laughs> 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 like his, his, his resume is one of those people who's done everything. Um, and he and I and, and uh, Derek Wyatt, who's the, the lead designer and also wonderful at story, and Matt Youngberg, our boss on Ben 10, who's mm -hmm. a, an artist showrunner, but also fantastic at story. The closest I've ever been to being in a in a writer's room was on the, that show with, with those guys. Um, but we would have a freelance writer come in, whoever's mm -hmm. assigned to that episode, and we all break the story. I use air quotes when I say that it's terminology we use for coming up with the, what the beats of the story are going to be, the, mm -hmm. the outline beats, and then send the writer off to to write them, um, and the writer gets sole credit for, for story and teleplay. And there are some shows where, because, um, I don't know why, I guess it's because the union doesn't, uh, <laughs> doesn't forbid it, where executives or, or head writers or people in charge will take story credit and money for mm -hmm. having done that part of the job, mm -hmm. either in part or, or in whole, and then the writer will just get the you know the, the teleplay credit for writing the, the screenplay it's it sort of it's, it's kind of unregulated so hmm. it's, it, it's kind of on on everybody's honor to do the right thing yeah <laughs> what the right thing is and i um i go by what my my husband said which is if you're getting story editor credit yeah part of your job is to break the stories and to have to rewrite extensive even if you have to rewrite someone's script from word one right they still are the writer and they still get the credit and nobody ever knows that it's really yours yeah and that's just part of the job that's just part of the job i agree with that and, and with that part of my job is we need to go to commercial uh -huh. and as soon as we go to commercial we'll come back and we'll talk about convention season the, i mean august is gonna be full of stuff i got tons of stuff to talk about in august then we're gonna go to charity work then we're gonna get screwball in a call so that he can get all the questions from you out there in the studio audience. So hang tight, we'll be back in just maybe a minute. Woo! Hello, mares. Look at your stallion. Now back to me. Back to your stallion. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But he could smell like me if he stopped using mare scented body wash and switched to apple spice. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're in an orchard with a stallion your stallion could smell like. What's in your hoof? Back to me. I have it. It's two tickets to the Grand Galloping Gala. Look again. The tickets are now diamonds. Anything is possible when your stallion smells like apple spice and not a mare. I'm a horse. <laughs> there we are. Apple spice body wash. I use it every day because my mare loves it. Don't you, Amy? Tell me. Tell me. She tells me every day that she loves the way I smell. Apple spice body wash for all you people out there. Go get some. And we're back with Charlotte of Fullerton. But in front and both sides. Front, both sides, all of it. You know, but we're gonna talk about conventions right now. So the big one, the big one is here. 
BronyCon, August 1st through 3rd in Baltimore. Guests are Andrea Libman, Tabitha, Rebecca Sochette, Kazumi Evans, Josh Haber, Daniel Ingram, Leo Award winner, Daniel Ingram, Terry Klassen, Andy Price, Heather Breckel, Tony Fleece, Katie Cook, Claire, and Ian Corlette. And now I'm going to be there too. So check us all out. We're all going to be there. Then we're going to go on to the Europe side, Galacon, also August 2nd and 3rd, Ludwigsburg, Germany. Guests, uh, Nicole Oliver, Julia Mainen, who's the German Twilight, Jennifer Weeb, who's the German Pinky, M.A. Larson, Pixel Kitties, Living Tombstone, Ellie Monty, John Animations, Shady Vox, Laser Pony, and more. Check out their website for more of what's going on over there in Ludwigsburg. Then Grand Brony Gala, August 15th to 17th, Tampa, Florida. Guests, Kathy Westluck, Michelle Kreber, Black Griffin, G.M. Barrow, the Brony Chef, and many more. Check out their website for more of what's going on there. Buck, back in Europe, August 22nd, 24th, Manchester in the U.K. Guests, Heather Breckel, Dave Polsky, and G.M. Barrow, as well as a list of community guests longer than my arm. This one over here that I don't have time to tell you all about. So check out their website to know everybody that's coming. They're going to have a huge, huge music scene. So if you're in there, go, go, go to that one. Lots of music. Brony Can... August 22nd, 24th, Richmond, B.C., Canada. They're really close to DHX, so guess who they got? Nicole Oliver, Jason Thiessen, Big Jim Miller, Daniel Ingram, Stefan Andrews, also a Leo Award winner, Steph Mahoney, Christopher Leonin, Rebecca Dart, Nicole Gauss, Georgia Ball, Amy Merberson, and Brent Hodges, director of uh, the Brony Tale movie that I happen to be in. He will be there. Ask him any question you want. Uh, just don't ask him anything about me. Uh, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia, Prague, Czechoslovakia. That's and that's 29th, 31st. That's just the month of August, people. Just the month of August. You have all those places to go. We have more through the end of the year. We've got Nightmare Nights. We've got all these really great places. We'll tell you more about them next show because I just ran out of time. <laughs> so we're gonna go into charity now. Last show. Maddie Peters was here, and she had, because I'm a girl, helping to get educational supplies to girls all over the world, and we did awesome. We raised 700 bits with Michelle Krieber when she was here for that charity. Guess how much we raised. Charlotte, just take a guess. How much do you think we raised? A million billion dollars. No, Close, but not quite. $1,181.99. Outstanding. Outstanding, people. Way to go. Way to go. Way to go. So, I'm going to get this stuff over here. We were going to give away this stuff over here. This pile. So, we had one. We had two dog tags. Unopened. Two dog tags. Two blind bags. Series one. We had one deck of My Little Pony playing cards, which are awesome. We had one blind box unopened. Series one. I still don't have a glow in the dark derpy. I'm still looking for it. And this, because we broke 500 bits, a Funko Rainbow Dash, which is Scootaloo's favorite pony. Right there. So all of that stuff is going to the person whose name I pull out of this hat. Right here. So we're going to dig in this hat. And we're going to take this one. Uh, oh, and I ripped it. Jeremy Sullivan. Jeremy Sullivan, you are the winner. Thank you very much, my friend. For the support. Awesome, awesome. And the, the winner of the last one with Kazumi Evans, I'm waiting for Kazumi's autograph to show up so I can ship to you. So that's what I'm waiting for. Um, I think, and then also, I'm also waiting for Maddie's uh, autograph, which is also part of that package, which is going to be on Pixel Kitty's art once Pixel gets that done. She's really busy right now with people getting autograph cards done for this wonderfully busy autograph season with all of these conventions so as soon as i get that stuff i will get that stuff out to you guys so now we move on the convention sound awesome by the way yes i want to go back to the czech republic (laughs) wouldn't that be cool chequestria charlotte wants to go people if if you want to meet me tell the conventions to invite me because yes i love to travel and darn it (laughs) there's tons tons of power ponies is hot right now i mean the maniac is the san diego comic-con special pony this year i so i did you see that uh, i've had fans actually that thing is awesome uh you know not not the product but send me pictures yeah yeah i think it's cool cool 
So we're going to move on to Charlotte's charity. Charlotte's charity is the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And MS is a terrible disease. Everyone knows about MS. Immune systems attack themselves. The central nervous system shuts down. Paralysis, chronic pain, blindness. Two million people around the world are affected by this. So we are going to do our best right now to give them a hand. You know what, Charlotte? Tell us a bit about why you like this charity. Well, I, I like the charity. I certainly don't like the disease. No. I'm hoping that we can um, Kick it. continue to raise money to, to, if not find a cure in, in our lifetime, at least manage the symptoms better. It affects everybody differently, as I understand it. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, um, just sort of this cure-all, uh, you know, one time, bang, done, uh, easy, easy thing to treat, um, never mind cure. It, it's... Yeah. Um, affected uh, in my own personal life. One of my very best friends uh, since we were children, we had the exact same birthday, same day, same year, um, except that she's 23 hours older than I am and likes to you know, rub it in. Mm -hmm. But um, when we were in our 30s, uh, one of us contracted MS and it wasn't me. And that's not through anything special that I did or anything bad that she did. It's just luck of the draw. And uh, one of my, again, one of my very best friends, her dad was our, my childhood dentist and, you know, good, mm -hmm. good friend of the family to this day. And uh, nobody deserves to have this happen nope. to them. And like I said, it's just, you know, at this point, I think um, the research is, is primarily for um, managing symptoms and making people's lives easier mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to obviously long term is to find a cure. But find in the it. meantime, we all want to, you know, be as, as happy and healthy as we possibly can. And uh, she's one of my favorite people. And uh, there you go. And we're gonna give it. We're gonna give it as much help as we can. So I really appreciate it. one of the things I love yes. about fandoms. You know, the bronies and and you know the Buffy fans and just sort of every different group of, of, of fans that I've ever come into contact with. At, you know, my own shows and just friends mm -hmm. is how generous everybody is. You know, that you don't have to approach the fans to become charitable everybody yes. just sort of mobilizes and does these kind of things it's wonderful yes, yes. For, all, for all the charities that we've done on this particular program charlotte we just broke 40 grand Jeez, fantastic and at the convention at the convention last weekend we broke 40 grand in one one freaking auction so Makes me proud and, I, for you and, guys. I, and i was i was the auctioneer for that and i was stunned so i was like how is this happening? But it's happening. Awesome. Um, so, yes, giveaways. Giveaways for this charity. We're going to start again with two more of the little dog tags. Two more dog tags. I went out and got this, which is the Baby Cakes Cake Family Babysitting Miniature Blind Bag set, which has, of course, Pound and Pumpkin Cake, Nurse Red Heart, and the Cake family plus pinky pie so just four baby cakes so that's gonna go and then i got one of these which you might not like you might like but it's called a busy book it's for younger younger fans but it also has all of these collectible blind bags you can't get anywhere else in here so if you collect blind bags you probably want these so this is a really cool little book it's got a little play mat in it and everything but usually it's for the the blind bag you can't get anywhere else so that's going to go also now if we break 500 bits 500 bits i got something over here in my hand that i picked up at the last convention i've already got one of these we've already given one away before but i'm sure somebody out there still needs one of these foil derpy card series two so i got another one of those for you guys so that's going to go for 500 dollars or more and i'm sure i could get charlotte to send me an autograph. What do you think? Oh, maybe. Maybe. Just sitting here thinking that if I can get my hands on uh, one of the um, maniac uh, home <gasps> characters, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the Comic Con exclusives, if I can get Hasbro to, to get me one of those, I can easily have uh, Betsy and Megan join me in signing that and maybe contribute that for uh, are for you, part of your auction, too. Are you kidding me? Uh, I'm not kidding you. Oh my now, God! Hasbro's gonna have to come through, right? <laughs> Has, well, somebody's got to have to come through. Yeah. Some, somebody's gonna have to come through at Comic Con to get one of those, so we can actually actually say that's gonna happen. 
No, we can say maybe that's going to happen. We can say maybe that's going to happen. That's a maybe that's going to happen. So you're going to have to like watch my website. Make it happen. Let's and we'll make it. Ha- let's make it happen. Find a way. We'll find a way to make it happen. Are you actually going to be at San Diego Comic Con? I am. There I you am. go. Well, you're going to be at San Diego Comic Con, but I'm sure you're going to be damn busy. So the entire time, but the panels yeah. I'm on are all Thursday, sort of back yeah. to back Thursday afternoon. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look me up, bring stuff for me to sign there. Yep, and absolutely. Don't say hi. Don't say hi. So f- with that, we're going to say that there's going to be an autograph from her either on a piece of paper, but it might actually be a maniac. But mm-hmm. watch the website, and I will we'll bring it up. If we can get it done, I'll put it on the website, and I'll put it on the uh, charity page. But you go to manlingsbroomery.com right now and click the charity page and go give a couple of bits, and you get into all of this. And maybe even, maybe even... Assigned maniac, unknown yet, but we'll try. I'm gonna try my best. Try our best. So I can at least print out uh, the cover pages of my scripts and sign them. There you go. Have that. There you go. Signed cover pages from the scripts. Yes. Or the maniac, whichever happens. There you go. Love it. Love it. Hey, Scrooby. 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 Yeah. Scrooby do. Would you like a Scroopy snack? Oh my goodness, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're Scrappy Doo. Scrappy Doo, then you're uh, Scrooby Cat? Yeah, Scroo- Scrooby know. Cat, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! See, this is exactly the kind of pop culture references that I didn't get yeah. age appropriately and only yeah. got later. Yeah, yeah now, now you know who Scrooby Doo You know who Scrappy Doo is. Yeah. Ask me anything about Mr. Rogers and the electric. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. Captain okay. Kangaroo, you know. No problem. Yeah. No problem there. Kangaroo got that Sesame Street for sure. Mr. Green Jeans. <laughs> yes, Mr. Green Jeans. Mr. Bu- Mr. Bunny Rabbit. And, and uh, I love the Bunny Rabbit. What was what, what was the moose's name? Was that Mr. Moose? Captain's. Yeah. Parrots and did, but wore yeah. eyeglasses. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, I, I think I think that you know I think that actually. Angel from MLP was actually, you know, Mr. Bunny Rabbit in a former life, you know. That's awesome. I actually wrote Angel more like, um, oh, God, what was that character's name? From Frosty the Snowman. Oh, the, that one. The, the, th- the little rabbit in that one. They never gave him a name. But... No, he did have a name. And did I he? I forgot what it is because I referenced it when I went to my story. Oh, okay. Um, but you know the one I mean. The, the, yeah, the, yeah. The quote, evil. The, the, the evil rabbit that went with the, the magician. But the fact that he, he did all the pantomime and, you know, the hocus, hocus pocus. Hocus, that's it, hocus pocus. Yeah. Okay, I was actually just thinking because I remember I had something to do with, like, spells or magic. <laughs> oh. So you know what, Scurry? I bet, I bet there's a billion questions for this nice, lo- nice lady. More so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, she answers. Let's see here. Uh, as many as possible. One second. I, I I always keep forgetting to reread through these as I do a lot of copy paste. <laughs> um, uh, copy paste. This one's from, from Kyle uh, uh, Kyle Tonerola. I hope I said your last name right. Um, this one's for you. Um, uh, is it Charlotte? Charlotte. Yes. Charlotte. Okay. I I always because it's spelled differently than how we spell it over here. <laughs> but Where's uh, I'm Alberta, Canada. Oh, cool. He's Canucka. He's in New Brunswick, Canada. Oh, you're in New Brunswick? I'm, I'm not there right now, but my family is from there, and that's where they are. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And Charlotte County, in fact. So, how uh, do you pronounce it in the West? That's perfect. <laughs> how do you pronounce uh, Charlotte in the West? Uh, sh- um, shoot. You know, not, 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 Charlotte? I know. I, I think I was Charlotte or something like that, because that's how I was originally going to be calling it. Yeah, that's that's the more it's, be, it's better than calling her shallots. It's the way it's spelled, and people wouldn't misspell it at Starbucks and places like. What if yeah. they start with S H A R and then L I T? It's better than calling her shallots. Yes. Uh, so the question. That's a cooking joke. I'm sorry. Oh, dusties. I don't cook, but I got it. There you go. <laughs> this is from Kyle. Uh, he wants to ask. Is it working on an episode with superhero themes like Power Ponies? How oh, was it? Oh, what? Oh. I didn't hear the actual uh, question. How fun was it to work on oh. an episode with superhero themes like Power Ponies? How fun was it? Yeah. This much fun. And my arms are as far apart as they can be. <laughs> That's how much. <laughs> That's how much fun. It was full of fun. No more fun could be stuffed into that package. 
Exactly. No more fun would be possible. Yes. Uh, no, it was fantastic. And uh, especially for me to get to, to co-write with my old friend Betsy McGowan was, was more fun than should be allowed to have. Yes. <laughs> That's the thing is that when it since 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 you're using like superheroes and stuff, you have such a much much variety to make an amazing story. Let's let's create some like crazy superpowers and just go with it. Yes, that's what I love. Sure. Yeah. Next. Um. One second. Uh. So this one is from. <laughs> I'll get rid of this to you, Dusty. Uh, this is from Star Cobra. How did you end up? Uh, how did you end up giving Lu uh, Princess Luna a piggyback ride at? Uh, how how did I end up giving Princess Luna a piggyback ride at Everfree Northwest? Well, you see, I guess I just got to come out and say it now. I'm actually on retainer, the equestrian government. <laughs> you know, it's been a big secret that yeah, that I'm on retainer with the equestrian government that I am Princess Luna's noble steed. At any convention she actually shows up at, so yeah, it just happened. I didn't. I know. I never thought it would ever happen. I never thought. You know, I signed this thing going, yeah, I'll just make five hundred bucks a month, and she'll never show up anywhere I'm at. But you know, it happens, and I got to make my bits. So there you go. You know, you signed a contract, you got to do the job. So there you go. But it was fun. But it was fun. Northwest, hey, invite me. <laughs> well, we, Actually, that, that reminds me, uh, Charlotte. Um, it, are you are you going to because you're going to Comic Con? Is there any other conventions you're going to soon? Uh, actually, that's the only one I, I know of. Mm -hmm. um, and not to sound pretentious, but my assistant might have other stuff lined up for me that I just haven't haven't paid attention to the calendar beyond July yet. Yep. Um, I don't know because work and and business and other things have just been so gosh darn time consuming. I'm I'm not sure what's up, but. Um, when it comes to my little pony conventions, yeah, you gotta tell people you want to meet me and, and yep. to invite me, and I'd love to go. Absolutely, we'll start doing that. That's for sure. Yay! Next. Yo, no wait. You know what? You know what? Mm -hmm. No. You know what time it is, Screwy? What? It's time for you know what, Screwy, episode eight. Whoa, 30 minutes where we went by just like that. Yeah, well, no, because we actually ran a little long on the front end. So oh, basically, awesome. we need to get this in right now. So okay. we're gonna take a break for a second, and we're gonna bring back. One of your favorite bits, which is You Know What's Screwy, Episode 8, Convention Edition. We'll be back in just about two and a half. Hold still. You Know What's Screwy? Conventions. That's cool. <laughs> Look at Moose. There's certain rules that you must follow when going to a convention called 621, which is six hours of sleep, two meals a day, and one shower. If you can't do the shower thing, then you have, well, this. You just, you know, spray it on. That, you know, the whole world will thank you for this. So do it. And now, Cass! You know what's screwing? Post-convention depression. There's only one thing that's great about getting back from a convention, and that is to see all your swag that you get from this place. As you can see, I'm wearing... I'm... <laughs> I can't stand on here, I'm sorry. Got... Well, yeah, I, I got a good King Sombra. Right there. I got this amazing thing. I hope I'm leaving at that right. Um, and then uh, these, these two things I actually got here. There's a Rainbow Dash uh, uh, tail and the Rarity tail, which is for my friend. And I got these two prints right here. Point. Um, <laughs> and then uh, some stickers and and that and uh, and then there's my badge right there. Uh, it's hard to aim this and I can't see a thing with this wig. Um, I had a blast at the convention. It was tons of fun. I got to see so many friends um, 
and I hope to see everyone uh, at another convention soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Screwy. Screwy, that, that's the best hair I've ever seen on you. That's awesome. Nothing, nothing it, it, you look like you look like a Ringo star. There, it's beautiful. Oh, actually, what was funny? Um, uh, actually, I, I lost. I can't remember what the people always kept calling me when they saw that wig. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, I never, I never had that lot of hair before. So wearing the wig, it felt very, very weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, but that that was convention season screwball. So hopefully, we're back to a consistent. You know what's screwy up epi every episode, so we'll see. I already, we... already got like three, maybe four that I got in the works. So. Awesome. Let's move on. Questions. Uh, one second. Let me, um, th I have so many questions on this board that I'm, I just want to pick up. Huh. Sorry. Uh, oh, so, uh, so actually, pay, um. Fudge cakes. I am just so flabbergasted by this. Okay, so this one's from Lunar Wrath. Um, question for everyone is, what is your favorite books? Ooh, favorite books. My favorite books? Wow. Yeah. Uh, I immediately go to, to Harry Potter, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that doesn't span my entire lifetime, so I'm trying to think of, okay, what, what are my favorite consistently... Uh, when I was a kid, my favorites were like Beatrice Potter and Stuart Little mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, Trumpet of the Swan, Charlotte's Web, that kind of stuff. I'm a huge fan of, was as a child and, and am still, of, of little animals wearing people clothes. Okay. I love that <laughs> genre. <laughs> my, my Muppets obsession, too. It's like, oh, little animals wearing people clothes. Oh, I love that. Or Wind of the Willows, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um but I'm all, uh, as an adult, a huge fan of the Harry Potter series. Cool. Me, I, I still, I was a hard science fiction fan mm -hmm. for a number of years. So uh, C.J. Cherry's The Shinur series, cool. um, read that back to front a couple of times. Um, had to because the, 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 the names were all really, really hard to read. <laughs> you know, when you were a teenager, it was like, and then you, you read them again when you're 20s, you read them again in your 30s, like, oh, that's how you say that word. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I love, I love that series still. Oh, uh, my most favorite would probably be, um, I'm thinking back to the ones I actually loved reading over and over again at school, which was like, uh, um, Ender's Game, by far. I loved that that uh, book. Um, but there was another that I read that was based on a true story. I think it was called Survive. Mm -hmm. It was basically about a airplane crash that was in the mountains. And uh, as bad as it is, these guys had to basically feast on the dead. And uh, the only way to survive. Hmm? They made a movie out of that? Yeah. I think they did too, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it, it's, it, was, it was all about survival. Uh, the fist basically but it was it, it was a really dark but really good read that explains your your gaming choices thing. yeah <laughs> next um actually uh because i know a lot of people were asking during the you know it's great thing uh, uh, uh everyone that person that was at the very start there that was michael dobson yes michael dobson <laughs> the, the bulk one biceps only, bulk biceps the one and only like, bulk biceps and uh because uh, I know some people were asking, I know yeah. one particular was asking, uh, is that your dad? He, he was on this program less than a month ago. God, come on, people. Next. Uh, so it doesn't sound like I only read children's books. I'm also a huge Noam Chomsky fan. There you go. Um, and things like, uh, I'm trying to think of, looking at my own bookshelf here, uh, Coming of Age in the Milky Way, I also love and reread that many times. Um, Big, big old Johannes Kepler fangirl. So I've I've read things that I I don't necessarily understand mm -hmm. <laughs> about about uh, astrophysics and uh, optics and things like that. Um, but I but I do love um, historical, real life characters and finding about about their real lives. Um, it's fascinating to me. Uh, this one is from Trailblaze uh, to you, uh, Charlotte. Um, what was your inspiration for the Maniac? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to have to say Megan. <laughs> 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 I think that that was her, uh, well, not only contribution, but that was something that came came from Megan. 
um, at the story meeting that this is the kind of villain we should have. So uh, as much as I'd love to take credit for it, and yes, I came in, it was fully formed, and it's all me. Um, no, that was a collaborative effort, and it, it originated with Megan. Nice. Next. Ooh, so this one is from... <gasps> James <laughs> Justice! Resident superhero! I'll stay burning my friends. <sighs> Hero against that scourge, soggy milk. Protect <laughs> protector of the cornflake. What does James want to know about today? Uh, if you don't get to everyone's questions, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet an answer. Yes. If you send me a question. Yes. So if, you send a, if you send a question we don't get to, she will tweet the answers. I will. After the show. So. Oh, so the question for all is, what has been your most favorite pulp culture joke slash crossover in the main show so far? Oh. That I didn't come up with? No. <laughs> <laughs> seen every single episode so i'm i'm probably ill equipped to to answer this one um i hate to i hate to choose based on limited evidence oh. <laughs> what's my favorite yeah can i withhold the response until uh <laughs> yeah what... give some more thought I'll yeah give us some more thought mine mine basically when uh one audrey hepburn when when rarity did her monologue because it was basically Audrey Hepburn. And then also in like the episode with the golden tickets, there was a Benny Hill chase scene. Okay. That was Benny okay. Hill. Yeah, it, it was. was. In fact, it was described as Benny Hill in the, in there, the script. There yeah. you go. Actually, Benny Hill I, chase scene. Yep. And, and you, in the most recent scene, it's great. I used that Benny Hill song from the show. <laughs> where you were carrying Luna. <laughs> yep. I saw that. But yeah, that was like my favorite and still my favorite. It's like the first thing that's like told me that this show was going to be different. Cool. So I I like it a lot. Uh, for me, um, I still freaked right out when I saw the uh, Bioshock Infinite reference with the uh, two uh, ponies um, walking by. That that's a gamers thing. No one would understand yeah. unless they played it. Yep. Um, and then there was the uh, another gamer thing, which was the Splinter Cell reference with Pinky. She's wearing the uh, the, those like night vision goggles and mm -hmm. the uh, and the tights and yep. everything else. And uh, uh, as soon as it's it sort of had that like standard trademark yeah. one two three goggles. Uh, well, Pinky going. Pinky in, in a different episode actually had gummy stuck to her head like the. <laughs> The aliens in in The Simpsons. Oh yeah. Sucking on her head. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny too. And those are the oh, kind of things I, that I'm I, not I, sure to credit the writer or or the directors of those episodes. That we'd, we'd have to yeah. we'd have to be asking the animation directors. Anime. A lot of the things that are visual design yep. um, aren't necessarily in the script. That's an example of, of people down the chain really plussing it yep. um, and making it even better than it was. Yep, that's cool. There Next. I know there was an actual website um, somewhere out there. I could probably link to you afterwards, Charlotte, uh, that gave every possible reference that someone has found in every single episode. <laughs> cool. Okay. And although, to point out, unless you confirm it with, you know, the writer, the director, somebody down, you know, yep. that, that had, uh, you know, will, will actively take credit for it. I know when it comes to Ben 10, man, on the fan sites and stuff, people are always uh, attributing um, references that aren't there yeah or, or that, that we didn't mean you know like we don't even know the reference material they're talking about and they'll say oh this is obviously uh, you know derivative of whatever mm -hmm. like oh, that would be really cool if it was but it's not it's not <laughs> you know? actually, didn't do that there's, there's one other reference and it was the season finale actually um where discord confronts um confronts uh, T-Rex wearing the cop outfit and he tries to use I think he like tries to use spell and then Discord's head splits in half which was a reference yeah. to um, uh, tr uh, Terminator 2 mm. yep. and I couldn't stop laughing when I saw that bit because it was perfect yeah because cool. he was a cop he was a cop in that scene and then they he, he like misses the magical bolt he splits in half sort of liquidy it was like <laughs> it had to be <laughs> it was easy yeah. Terminator 2 yeah that's the kind of thing that's going to be great for kids, you know, when they grow up and yeah. get that reference, much again like the Muppets or anything else, the mm -hmm. Warner Brothers cartoons, when you watch them as a kid. Yeah, you didn't get it. Get so much out of it, and then you go, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. So. Well, that's like, I was, you watched Warner Brothers as a kid, our age, right? 
and they were right on TV, you know, like uh, uh, the Nature Boy, you know, Bugs Bunny versus the Nature Boy, you know, cartoon. They don't even show that anymore. They don't yeah, even put it on TV. So heavily when I saw so, it on TV on, on ABC. It yeah. Was, you know, duck season, rabbit season, season? And they cut out all the gunshots, so it didn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. I was like, Pfft. yeah. Why at all? Next. Uh, so this one. Um, it's from uh, Leo, Leo Hardship. A uh, question for all. Uh, what what Power Pony Pony Sona would you have if you were teleported into the comic book? Oh, geez. Oh, wow. What would I have mm. would be best for my... Think up, like, wow. even a name or just take one from the comic itself. It's up to you. <laughs> um, oh, it's tough to do off the yeah. top of your head. It is tough to do off the top of your head. I mean, um, it's also something I would have a good friend of mine that knows my personality really well mm -hmm. come up with because it has to be something that that makes good use of your own yeah. strengths and weaknesses. Your own strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes it's easier for somebody else to point that out to you than yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I would be a lot like Zap, but I would have a I would have a uh, an enchanted wrench, right? It would sort of look like Thor's hammer. It would be this <laughs> enchanted wrench that could fix anything, right? And I would be I would be that guy in the back that, was, that the back of the 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 jet plane or whatever whatever the, the group had is like never went out on a mission. He just sit there and fix stuff. Going yeah, you guys go yeah. I never get the I never get never get to go on the fun stuff. I'm just back here fixing your stuff, fixing things. That's it. I wrote a preschool <laughs> show called um, Firehouse Tales in the mid 2000s, mm -hmm. and it was called, the episode was called Off the Wall. And it was about the the alarm uh -huh. uh, that was on the firehouse wall, but never got to go on adventures or. Do oh that. yeah. And, uh, and that, episode, that would be. I think that I think the the siren on the fire truck broke, and he finally got his big chance to to replace the siren and go on the go on a call. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> guy, guy, that. you know, guys, I'm getting, I'm getting a news break. Ooh. I'm get I'm getting a news break in my ear. It's like, is that really? Joe? Is that you? Joe Stevens? No way. Where you been? Okay, you, you got a you got a story? Okay, oh, you got a story. Okay, I'll play it. Okay, you're coming in right now. All right, stay right there. Thank you, Dusty Cat. This just did. Ponyville resident Rainbow Dash is suing all of Equestria for trademark violation in the overuse of rainbows. This is a new move for Rainbow Dash, as her normal interruptions of national commerce usually involve massive property damage, sonic rainbowing the sun to create deadly levels of radiation, and setting ducks on fire. But now, Rainbow Dash is claiming that the use of the term rainbow is her intellectual property and her very identity. In the suit, Rainbow Dash claims that there are too many items now using the word rainbow, and it is damaging to her person and reputation. While it is true that rainbows have been covering more things lately, there's rainbow-powered twilight, rainbow stickers, rainbow action figures. I mean, they've even got rainbow rocks. Admittedly, this is a large amount of rainbow things. But Princess Celestia claims that throwing rainbows on things is completely harmless and enhances the appeal of objects. It's not... It's not like rainbows are radioactive or anything. <laughs> Rainbow Dash's lawsuit, however, is not about rainbows being unsafe, but about her brand. When questioned about the lawsuit, Rainbow Dash stated, They're trying to change who I am and ruin my identity. My name has rainbow in it. I have a rainbow-colored mane. Rainbows are such a part of me that they're literally coming out of my... Rainbow Dash has already begun calling herself Rainbow Rainbow Dash to further her own ownership of the term rainbow. However, this could lead to others adding two rainbows to things and escalate Rainbow Dash to the point where her new name is forced to be Rainbow 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 Dash Dash Leibowitz. I'm Joe Stevens, and this has been a news break from the Equestria Inquirer. Back to you, Dusty Cat. And that is Joe. Joe, you, thanks a lot for that, Joe. I mean, gee, what? You want to be on the show? You you want to do a regular bit? Really? That'd be awesome. Oh, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk after the show. That'd be great. Okay, okay, man. Yeah, I'll see you later. Cool. Hey, hey guys, guess what? Joe Stevens is back. EQI is back. 
So he's going to be a regular bit on the show. So don't miss it. Every show, we're going to have a new bit from, from EQI. He's the man on the street in Ponyville. We all know that. He's going to be right on the pulse of what's going on in Equestria and bringing you all the news that's fit to print. So don't miss it on all the shows. And with that, we're back with Charlotte. And I'm sure we got some questions left. We got, we got like 12, 15 minutes left, dude. Give me some questions. Fire hose it. Well, first off, Joe, you're an amazing guy. <laughs> Um, and why, um, uh, actually, uh, I almost forgot that my superhero thing, because of you, Dust, you know what my superhero name is? What? Scrooby. <laughs> <laughs> Scrooby! Is that because you're a really good rally driver and you, you drive your Scrooby-roo everywhere? <laughs> Scrooby-roo. <laughs> uh, is, is that like a Subaru? But... Yeah, it's like a Subaru, but it's a, it's actually specially powered Scrooby-roo. You know, it's twin turbo powered, and and your your actual your actual you know sidekick is wildfire. Oh, oh I love that. I guess I'll get the on that. <laughs> questions, questions, uh, questions. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I it's I always get, lose it every damn time. Um, ooh, so this oh, is for the another question. Let me give a shout out to uh, the USC Bronies. My, Do it. My buddies back at. Uh, my alma mater, who are currently students or, or recent grads, and they're just been fantastic. They're not only they you know great fans of the show and all, but um, super talented in their own way. You know, one guy's a jazz musician, composer. People are writers. Another one does fantastic array of character voices. And I just yeah, they've been to the house here and taught me the My Little Pony card game, which I'm incredibly horrible at. <laughs> I don't understand it, but um, I'm getting there, and they've been very patient. And I'm really looking forward to what they, they end up doing in their career. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, a question from the really new mob. A uh, question is, favorite episode you've written, either in Pony or outside of Pony? My own favorite episode that I've ever written. Um, I guess it, it's, a, it's, a, it's got to be Fairly Odd Parents because, I mean, Kim Possible was amazing for having been a, a fan of that show for so long and then to get invited to write one was amazing mm -hmm. in the same way with fairly odd parents i was a fan of that show even longer just because we've been on the air for so long right to get to write one and then be nominated for miami for the very first time even though i lost i mean that's you can't have yeah. it, you know the dream that is, that's the definition of living the dream like yes, it's me i can't believe this is my life you know so i'd have to say as much as i love pony and certainly ben 10 has been good to me as a franchise i mm -hmm. love it and um and all the people that I've worked with, uh, uh, Fairly Odd Parents has got to be the, the dream come true. Cool. Next. Uh, so this one is from, uh, oh, for fudge case, I keep getting so many ones coming in. Uh, uh, Fairly Odd Parents is if I got to write a Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. Anybody out there that can hook me up, man, that would be the ultimate dream come true. <laughs> uh, oh. Nah, I love fudge cakes. I'm so out of it today, my lord. <laughs> it's that it's that long break we had. Yeah, I, I know. I don't know. Um, so uh, this this one's from Arch Scribe. A uh, question for uh, Charlotte. Um, when writing for an episode, is is there a specific format the script needs to be written in, or is it, or is it in the riff, uh, in the in, or is it the writer's preference? Wow, that's a good question, and um, it's very specific, the format that it needs to be written in. My Little Pony has its own, Ben 10 has its own, Kim Possible. Um, and you end up, if the show is already either on the air, you can, you can watch and see what the format is, but as a writer, you're sent samples. Um, unless you're developing the show, and at the very beginning, like, look before you sleep, mm -hmm. there weren't that many episodes, but at least there were the first couple written right. um, that I could see to follow the format. But sometimes... You have a tag. I mean, tag. You have a, um, have a. God, why am I a teaser? Mm -hmm. uh, first act, second act, third act, and a tag at the end. Sometimes you just have the teaser, first act, second act, third act. Sometimes just first, second, third. If it's an eleven-minute uh, episode, you'll just have two act. You know, it depends. Um, and you can tell as a viewer when you watch, you'll know where the act breaks are because there'll be a commercial <laughs> or at least a fade to black if you're watching online. So mm -hmm. that's an excellent question. And every show has its own, um, not just format in terms of how it's broken down like that, but what the, what it looks like on the page, the, the way, um, 
scenes are described and, and um, you want to see a, a, an existing script for anything you're writing so that you so that yours looks right that's a very good question cool wow. next uh, so this one from bot 117 uh, for you Charlotte uh, is there you know this is a toughie is there any is there anything you wanted to write for an episode but the company said not to Probably. <laughs> to, to, uh, yeah, off the top of my head to, to remember. Um, things like My Little Pony, though, were extremely accepting. Um, and the only things that have been cut that I can think of on Ben 10 that I would have liked to have seen in are cut for time. It's not that the company is saying, oh, you can't do that. It's that it's just running long after they yeah. boarded it all out. Um, there's only so much time. And speaking of time, we, we've got to keep clipping along here. So I'll shut up. Yep. Next question. Next question. <laughs> um, uh, so this one's from Wayf Wayfair uh, for uh, Charlotte. How how hard was it to come up with the superhero names in Power Ponies? Uh, we sort of talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, that was a collaborative effort with, with Betsy McGowan, the co-writer, and with Megan, the head writer, um, and um, with a couple of the people at Hasbro, the executives there, tossing around ideas and, and a lot of back and forth. So it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. hard, to come up with ideas um like any kind of a team effort it's quote hard to come to an agreement you know <laughs> like oh it's an awesome name oh no but this one's awesome also you know yes. trying to settle on and, uh, that's the downside of everybody but, but we can't trademark that but yeah that too yeah you've got to run everything by legal and make sure yep. that it isn't already in use and and sometimes you know the best names are the most appropriate one you just can't use it mm -hmm. next yeah, so this one's from uh, Ironic uh, Ironic Jest. Uh, question for Charlotte. Um, what was it like meeting Jim Hen Henson, and what was it like working on Trop Star Wars? On what? I think it was... Uh, I don't know if troops. It was troops. Troops, I'm guessing, oh, okay. is what it was. This is still in here. Star Wars, I wish. But um, uh, what it was like meeting Jim Henson is... is um, and talk about dream come true. I had to pinch myself every day and, and wonder if that that really happened. <laughs> Luckily, mm -hmm. my dad was there, so I have had witnesses. You know, just gosh, this is my life. You know, that's um, amazing. Uh, and I've told that story in detail in other other interviews, so I won't I won't take up too much time here with it. Yeah. Um, and troops is another one of those weird uh, things in my life. The right place, the right time. Things just kind of hitting. My friends and I, uh, including Kevin Rubio. Um, Steve Melching, Dave McDermott, a whole bunch of friends, Cricket Peters, um, friends from film school and, and friends that were working at Fox Kids at the time, just got together with our own, own time and very little money. It was $1,500 for location permits and food, mm -hmm. and everybody just chipped in their you know, work for free. It's a quarter of a million dollar movie, and, and mm -hmm. everybody worked for free and just like, let's just do this and do something cool. If someone would give us a chance, we could really do something awesome, and no one's just going to give you the chance. We're just going to do mm -hmm. it. You got to do it. You know, and we didn't have YouTube then to you know put it out on online, um, and yet uh, it ended up becoming the first viral video in history before there was such a term as viral mm -hmm. video. Um, Premier Magazine at the time credited us with starting the entire entertainment online phenomenon. <laughs> wow! Yeah, that's what we said. We're like, wow! We didn't set out to do that. It just yes. kind of happened. Before you know, before that, we all traded VHS tapes. Yes. <laughs> It. it was it just happened the internet it was still dial up at the time but yeah. you know it, it just it, it, convergence of you know technology and, and timing and putting something out there that people wanted to seek out and see and, mm -hmm. and just go figure you know <laughs> cool hey screwball i wish i could say it was premeditated you know like oh yeah we had this great plan but no it just it just nope, sort of it happened just happens that way hey screwy yo it's that time buddy oh five case i know but remember <laughs> Any question that gets in after the show, go back to go to Twitter and Charlotte will answer them on her Twitter after yes. the show. So give me that one last on air question, buddy. Why don't we do what we nor sometimes do at the end oh, of it? Oh yeah, why don't we do that? What's that? Hey Charlotte. Is have you had do you have any question for say the bronies that we might be able to answer for you? Oh wow. Uh well I guess the question would be the big, the big question for me would be what, what is it about My Little Pony as a, as a show, as a, as a franchise, as a, as a thing that, that draws people to it as adults? Is it what we think 
um, like what I was describing earlier, the same multi-layers, like a Sesame Street that's made for young children, but clearly has things in it that tonally or otherwise are, are for adults. It's Those not just tips. that. Like, there might be the occasional hint towards the adults, but mm -hmm. what really grabs us was the writing, the care, the lovable characters. Every single, every single character, someone can relate to at least yeah. one. Yeah. And, and they connect at such a level with 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 the show, and it's and not just that, but there's also uh, even the music is mm -hmm. just yeah. mind blowing phenomenal. Yeah, the, the music is better than this show has any right to be, for one. For two, you've got the way they wrote the characters. You've got six characters that can play off each other very well, and they're all so well, you know, characterized that anybody can see themselves in any one of the six, or even two of the six. So you've got the, that very relatable character that you want to put yourself into. You know, I, I sort of put it the same way you would see like manga comics, right? Mm. The, when they want to want you to really remember something, they have very detailed, you know, drawings. But if they want you to put yourself in that in that scene, they draw the main character very simply, so that the the mind can go into and put themselves into that that character. Interesting. At least that's where I'm coming from because I come from a comic book background. But I've also been an animation nut my entire life, all the way back to early Disney, all the way back to Battle of the Planets, all the way back to Kim of the White Lion. So, you know, having a show which took us out of the wasteland of crud that we had <laughs> in the 80s, or in the, seven, in the late 70s, early 80s of cartoons, you know, it basically... Give me something great to watch, and I'll watch it, right? I don't want to. I don't want to have another, you know, Schleister, you know, rotoscoped piece of crud. You know, I want something good that's wholesome, that's funny, that has great music, and I'll watch it. I'll watch the heck out of it, you know, and I'll love it because you know I want that. I want that in my entertainment. So I would rather do that and have that platform to to, to have a universe to play in. To do songs, to do stories, to do things with that are all just you know it's 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 a wide open field. I mean, they gave you all of this really great background, and all this really great story that you can actually use your imagination. You to, just described why it's so wonderful to write on this show. Yeah, um, that's exactly at least the way I feel as a as a writer on this is that Lauren and and Rob Renzetti just established this amazing set of characters and, and environment mm -hmm. and, and let us go to town with coming up with fun things to do with them and I'm, the fact that you all react to the the strong individual characters and the way they're written um is, is wonderful to hear as a writer I'm that's sure. that's what we do and that's what we love to do so we are at sadly the end of the program I throw the last minute yes. uh, shout out last minute shout outs do it I want to throw out a shout out to Mitch Larson. Mitchie. Because not only an outstanding writer, and everybody should be lucky enough to work with this guy, but um, an outstanding human being. Just yes. have to say it. He is the man. Agreed. N new t shirt. Trish got done with her BronyCon assignments. Guess what? She finished this for us. The brand new t shirt I've been promising you guys for about a month now is here. So go over to Redbubble and check out this t shirt with me and Screwy taking a ride on the bike. So check that one out. Love to see you wearing it this year at the conventions. So, uh, you know, all money goes to keeping this this great program going. And we'd love to see you wearing it. Uh, big thanks go out to... Where's my list? There it is. Charlotte for taking time out of her busy schedule to come and talk to us. I do it. I'm sorry it took so long. No, it's all right. It's all right, man. We just had to find that day. Just had to find that day. <laughs> and here we are. And then Screwy... For doing everything he does, taking care of all you guys out there. Cowboy Dave, making us look so good on the YouTube. So good. Care to win, my landlord and partner in crime that couldn't do any of this stuff without him. Amy, my wonderful girlfriend, who loves the smell of apple spice. And you, out there, who come every time we turn on a camera and make dang fools out of ourselves. Every time. So, thank you for coming. And with that, we're out of here. Two weeks, which is the last show before BronyCon... Our guests, guests, not just one, guests, Ian oh. and Claire Corlett. Oh, nice. So we finish our set of Cutie Mark Crusaders with Sweetie Belle coming on the program. So don't miss it two weeks from now. And with that, we're out. Be excellent to each other. Say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. We hate to leave you, but we'll be back soon. Good night, sweetheart. Good night. Good night, sweetheart. Good night.